The moon actually has quite a few interesting and unique features that we can see here from Earth. Some of them look really strange off the get-go, like you would not expect that on the moon, and then others look really simple or common, but are actually really complicated too. So today we're going to look at five of these things and see exactly what they look like through my telescope. So get ready for me to butcher some Latin names, because here we go. First up are lunar swirls, specifically Rainier Gamma in this case, located in Oceanus Procellarum. Now, lunar swirls don't look like they belong on the moon. They're these odd patches of wavy coloration painted onto the surface, and it took a long time to figure out what exactly made up these patterns on these specific locations. And the answer is actually local magnetic fields. So, metals buried just beneath the surface in these areas generate local magnetic fields that then direct the solar winds into channels, much like the northern lights do here on Earth. Except, without an atmosphere, the cosmic rays rain down on the lunar surface, and this bleaches the local regolith, making a fluid-like tattoo on the surface. Rainier Gamma is also a pretty decent size, it's actually one of the easier things on this list to actually image. Uh, so you only really need a medium-sized telescope to meaningfully resolve it. But through my big telescope, this is what it looks like. And up next is number two, Messier Crater. It's plural, kind of. Uh, Messier Crater is located in Mare Fecunditatis, and it is an anomaly among craters, especially in regards to its shape. See, overall, basically all craters are circular, and that was a pretty curious observation until we actually studied, uh, studied crater formation in the lab. Scientists blasted these projectiles into these pits and figured out that the primary thing that actually creates the shape of a crater is the explosion, the vaporization of mass on impact. Much like nuclear bombs, this is spherical, which hence leaves the circular crater in the surface. And this is true for all sorts of speeds and angles of attack, except sometimes they found that if you come in at just the right low angle, you can actually skip your projectile off of the surface, much like a flat rock can skip on water. And these skips leave oval-shaped depressions in the surface and shoot ejecta outward sideways instead of in the direction of the projectile. And that's exactly what we see with Messier Crater. Admittedly, um, the specific impact that formed Messier Crater was probably a little bit involving a partial breakup, which is partly why you get the double, but this is one of the few really well-defined large craters that we can see that have this sort of shape. And see it we can, it is very visible to medium and large scopes. The small ones might even be able to pick it up here too, but the structure is really apparent whenever you catch it at the right time with the right shadows. Uh, that can be a little bit difficult based on the phases of the moon, but you can really pull out some nice features with this one in particular. And number three on this list is Ina. Ina is probably the most difficult on the list to image, but it's located in Mariviporum, and it's actually a hardened lava lake. The thing that makes this a bit more special than a bunch of the other Mara out there, which are technically lava lakes too, is this specifically is very rich in titanium, and because of that, it is faintly blue. These images have their colors a little bit saturated. It doesn't look quite like this, but it was color that was capturable by the Apollo astronauts during their flyovers, which is pretty dang cool. Though it is visible to us here on Earth, it's generally going to take a larger scope to actually distinguish this. Um, here's some pictures with my big one, and we get some pretty good separation and definition on Ina. And if we saturate our images too, you can clearly see that blue coloration, which is really cool. And number four is the site of Apollo 15. Apollo 15 had to be one of the coolest Apollo missions. It took place on this flat-ish plain between Hadley Rill and the Apennine Mountains, and it was a mission of several firsts, including the first use of a ridden rover on the moon. And from the amazing footage they captured, we have these on-the-ground views of these different landforms that previously we had only ever, ever seen from orbit. And we here on Earth can actually see the biggest of these landforms too. The rill, the mountains, and even the smaller hills around that area with some medium to large scopes. And 
And though it's out of the capabilities of our equipment here on Earth to actually see the descent stage, LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, has actually imaged the descent stage and a bunch of tracks made by the rover and some of the astronauts. It's just, it's a pretty cool piece of history and maybe we'll go back at some point. And number five is concentric craters, specifically Hesiodus, which is located on the very southern edge of Mare Nubium. So your first thought might be, this is just a coincidence. You've got one crater that's smack dab in the center of another, just happen to be. There's a ton of craters on the moon. It's bound to happen at some point. But if that were true, there would be a normal distribution of concentric craters amongst the craters on the moon. And that is not the case. They actually happen to show up specifically around the edges of these mare, which scientists believe this internal secondary crater is actually the result of faults occurring underneath the original larger crater. Which, much like the formation of lunar rills, points to geologic movement in the not so distant past of the moon, at least in astronomical terms anyways. Hesiodus is a pretty decent size, but it has some features around it that make it really easy to locate too and you should be able to resolve it, including that middle ring through a probably a medium-sized telescope. But if you do have a larger one, there is a concentric crater southwest of it called Marth that we are actually able to see through mine as well. So here's some pictures. And finally, our hidden number six on this list movement of lunar shadows on the moon, specifically for sunrise and sunset. These are best captured near a half moon, but it can vary a little bit depending on the time of year. But the thing you really want to look for is specific landforms that can cast larger shadows or have weird different elevation changes. Shadows on the moon do move pretty slowly. It's about one lunar day per month, it's 13 to 12, but if you're watching for your opportunities, you should be able to get something pretty good, even if it's not super optimal. Just look for the proper mountains and craters and stuff. Here's an example of some lunar shadow movement that I shot. You can see the shadows moving a little bit in that crater, as well as on some of the mountains up north. But those were just some things that I thought were neat that I thought were also kind of cool to image, especially if you're coming back with a big scope but let me know if there's anything that I missed down in the comments below. So until next time, guys, see ya.